Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Michelle de Klerk, and I'm the founder of the Women's Chapter. And I am delighted to have James Oakley here with us today. He's the founder of James Oakley Media and one of the Women's Chapter partners. And the reason that we partnered with James is because digital marketing is such a sticking point for so many of you in our community. James works with a lot of the Women's Chapter members. And in fact, he was doing that before I realized um, that a partnership between us was such a natural synergy. So James, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and this session is part of a series of events that James and I have put together, really where I've been able to kind of um, tap into his knowledge and pick his brains around the, the topics that are most relevant for those of you that are building and scaling a business. So, James, a very, very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, just a reminder to those that are coming into the room, this will be recorded. We're recording it and we'll be sharing the assets with you afterwards. Please, for the sake of um, minimizing background noise, keep your microphones on mute. Um, this is going to be an interactive session and we will have time for questions at the end. But for now, I'm going to hand over to James. I'm going to remove myself from the spotlight so that you can see him and he will be able to share his screen with you and tell you a little bit more about what we're going to be dealing with today. Great. Thank you very much, Michelle. So, yes, hello, everybody. And for those of you who weren't on our previous um, masterclass, just very brief one minute introduction about us. So the topic today is obviously on actually getting real ROI from your marketing and what you're spending, whether that's in your time or actually with actual money um, that you're spending, say, on Facebook or Google ads, things like that. Um, history about us is we, our whole defining factor is that we are an ROI focused digital agency, which if I'm being frank, not many agencies are. And the reason we got involved with the women's chapter is because we work with Lara Morgan, who originally put us in touch with Michelle, um, just based on the fact that she was also sick of digital agencies who weren't ROI focused. Luckily we were, we built up a really good relationship and actually earlier this year she became a uh, minority investor in the company as well. So that's where our connection directly comes from. So we are part, part women owned and, and part male as well. So it's a nice synergy in that Lara is very strong on the ROI. That's something which I know is really valuable to a lot of you guys from what Michelle said. And especially as depending on the different stages of your business, today's really gonna try and address that from sort of when you're really just starting to grow but also from when you've grown a little bit and actually you need to take it then to the next stage where you really scale your business and what you're going to do then. So I'll run through a couple of more basic things at the start, more as like checklists to make sure that you have them um, running. And then we'll go into some more details and some actual examples. Um, as Michelle said, there will be time for questions at the end. So feel free to, to throw those out. And Michelle, I know you'll pick those up as well and we can run through them at any time. Um, Brilliant. On that note, I will just share my screen. If anybody, or Michelle, actually, if you can't see the screen, just give me a shout. But sure. Okay. A, and while you're doing that, actually, I, I know that there are quite a few people in the room that know Lara, um, but it's a massive endorsement, uh, the work that James has done with her, because Lara is so very no nonsense uh, and all about return and not doing anything unless you're getting a return on your investment. So, um, you know, that's another reason that we absolutely love working with you, James. And I know that you've done great work for all of the businesses that Laura owns as well. Right. Yes, I can see that. Brilliant. As a, um, yeah, as Michelle said, if we weren't giving <laughs> Laura return on investment results, I probably would have been um, murdered by now. So she is, uh, <laughs> as I said, she is no nonsense. But as I say, that means that we work together really well because that's exactly what we are as well. Um, so the first slide, I always title this, and even on the last class, which wasn't directly related to this, it's return on investment focused digital marketing, because that's what we do. And whether it's you yourself doing it, or actually say you're hiring an agency or working with different partners, you should always have your digital being return on investment focused. That's got to be, whether that's in one month or a year, depending on what your customer life cycle is, it has to be return on investment focused. And so then today, tell me if there's any issues with going through this. Michelle, just to confirm that you can see the next slide. Yes, I can. Brilliant. Um, so today is all about the actionable steps that you can actually take to build campaigns that give you that ROI. So the first set of actionable steps, as I say, will be actually what you need to have set up. And these are what I would call sort of the, the more boring slides as such. And then we'll get into the exciting stuff of actually how we go and then take that to the next level. 
So the first thing, just really four things to, to check off, um, but I just wanted to present a really brief process um, just on things that you could actually screenshot this or anything like that, but the core to anything that we do and how we actually give, say, reports which are ROI focused and allow the business owners and marketing managers that we work with to see effectively if we are doing a good job is by making sure all tracking and monitoring is set up making sure that we're constantly testing and creating new ad copy creatives, audiences, um, landing pages, different pages on our website, and then actually making the decisions based off the results that we get from that testing. So it really is make sure tracking is set up, test lots, and based off that testing, make your future decisions um, on how you spend your time and digital budget um, based on those results. So just to check for, for everybody very quickly is ensure that these different events and tracking are set up. So on your website at the moment, as a very base, you want to have your Google Analytics completely set up, your Facebook pixels, as well as say anything else, for example, like a Pinterest pixel, Google Tag Manager set up, any thank you page events. So if you're B2B and you have an inquiry form and it goes to a thank you page once somebody submits an inquiry, you need to be able to track where those came from so that you can see actually was it from Google, was it from a referral, was it from something else. And then finally, if you're e-commerce, actually you need to have all of your purchase events ready, set up to track so that you can actually see where your purchases are coming from. And obviously going down one level from that, actually where your add to carts are coming from and things like that. So again, as part of previous slide tracking and monitoring, we want to go and completely set up those things, make sure everything is in place. If you, are, if you don't have those in place currently, I, I would advise you to do it before you begin spending any significant time or money on your digital marketing, because without this information, you're going to be stuck going forwards as to saying, okay, this is working or actually this isn't working. So that's really going to be um, important. Then, um, James, just to go yeah. back a slide, what does thank you page events and purchase events relate to? So um, as I mentioned, if say, for example, you're a B2B and mm -hmm. you have that contact page on your website and I submit a contact form, I'm interested in your services, could you call me? then I should be going to a thank you page after that. And then actually we can then track that thank you page and see if I came from whichever source, whether it was Google or Facebook or Pinterest, whatever that might be from. So it's tracking anything whereby they go to an important page on the website. Um, as an example, if it wasn't a purchase event, it could be a post purchase survey that we do. And again, anybody who lands on that survey, we know that they have to have made a purchase. But of course, it's essential to our business to know where we came from when we made that purchase so that we see which channels convert the best for us, which channels give us the highest number of revenue or inquiries, and actually which channels are producing a positive ROI for what we're doing. Does that make sense? Please tell me if not. Yes, thank you. Right. No, no worries. Then the other thing, just again, to make sure it's in place before we again get into the meat of it, so to speak, is knowing actually who your customer is. So you might be a fairly, let's say, startup stage business and actually you don't have thousands of customers that you can go and track and see exactly who they are. But that doesn't mean you can't learn who your customers are. So let's say you've only had 100 purchases, as an example, um, or say you've only had 50 inquiries if you're B2B. Um, I would be personally following those people up and learning about them so that I could create a mini customer avatar so that I know where I should be spending again my digital time my digital dollars or pounds um, on and who I should be spending it on as well because you're always going to have a best customer type even if you have a broad range of customers and depending on what level you are at as a business and how fast you're scaling the personal follow-up is literally the first thing that you can do and you can learn immediately and it might be as an example that you notice your customers are generally men. That's the most sort of basic thing, men or women. Then you might actually notice that actually our products are for women, but actually it's women over 35 or under 35 who are buying them. And that allows you to begin getting ready to spend that time and money, knowing you're going to be targeting the right type of people. The second is to monitor everything that I've just mentioned on the previous slide through Google Analytics, so that actually you can perform and see when you spend your digital cash and time, where you want to spend those. And if you've got, as an example, 250 transactions, Google will give you a good breakdown as to the ages, the genders, and the locations potentially of those people. 
So again, when you're ready to spend actual money on your marketing, whether that's on Facebook, Google, somewhere else, you know that you can target specific demographics, locations, types of people, and immediately be targeting the best type of your customers, even if you don't have, let's say, that sort of 200, uh, sorry, more than 250 purchases. So you can be pretty early on in your business stage to actually be able to have that data. Once you're scaling a little bit more, and this, let me know if anybody's doing sort of over, and feel free to, to jump in, but if you're doing sort of over 5,000 um, transactions a month, let me know because that will change slightly. But really from then on, once you're actually fully into the thick of things, taking into account the demographic results and stats from every one of your paid marketing campaigns, so this is sort of when we get to that medium and larger types of business, actually in studying, okay, what is working? So when we used a specific type of testimonial, is that really appealing as an example to under 40s or women or men, depending, and making sure that from each campaign, we know the demographic statistics of how much revenue, how much our conversion rate is and what the ROI is from our different demographics that we have as customers. So I would literally be going through Google Analytics and studying each marketing campaign to see where we had performed well and actually also where we hadn't because we don't want to spend money when we don't need to. And then once we're sort of at that, getting to that bigger stage where we're doing probably upwards of 500 sales, let's say, in terms of from an e-commerce perspective per month, um, something you can directly look at is Acorn profiling. And that's actually whereby it's a feed to do, but it gives you a full breakdown of your customers and actually, in terms of that, it will give you everything you need to know about your customer types. So it will give you the percentage in people, this is UK based, just so you know, um, percentage of people in the UK who fit into one of 36 different customer types and the percentage of your customers who fit into each of those types as well. That way, then you learn very quickly who your best types of customers are, who your most frequent types of customers are, and also what their interests are, typical ages, household status, salaries, everything like that, which again will enable you to do a much deeper job. And it's almost like you've done a mini personal follow-up, but to say 5,000 customers as opposed to 50. So that's taking and scaling up as we go from small business to actually scaling business, fast growth. We want to be doing some Acorn profiling. So those are almost, again, like the four things we can directly check off. James, just a question on Acorn profiling. You, yeah. you mentioned um, like 500 purchases. Do they actually need to be purchases? And is is there a minimum number of those that you need? Yeah. Um, or is it can it be done on engagement? So with Acorn profiling, it is based off the postcode of the delivery addresses for okay. the e-commerce aspect of where we are. So it needs to be a purchase, or obviously it might be, say, somebody who's gifted. But in that sense, that is how they get that very specific data. So that's where effectively like we'll work on Acorn profiling. So it's purchase only. Hence, you need to be at that slightly larger level as a business to be able to use it effectively because it works much better if you enter, as an example, 5,000 pieces of data as opposed to 500 just because you don't effectively you need to build up the amount of data to get the best results okay um then just briefly uh, before we go on to actual direct examples is things that we are going to need to know again to actually scale what is the long-term roi from our purchases because for a lot of people it's getting in that first sale if it's not profitable might be mean that you actually can't scale your business, but you haven't potentially looked at the repeat purchase rate from your customers. And that might mean that actually your business is scalable, especially if you have a replenishable product or something like that, or a service which is effectively ongoing. So as an example, generally we work with somebody um, on a monthly basis and typically providing that we do a good job, obviously we work, um, with them over a number of years and so if I simply did a return on investment from our level on a first month of the fees that we charge actually we'd almost definitely be losing money every time it's only the fact that we actually stay and work with people as partners over a long period of time that we become a profitable business and it's exactly the same way from an e-commerce focus so that effectively if your product is purchased once every three months or twice a year Actually, if you know the three, six and 12 month lifetime customer value, that will allow you to scale a lot faster in your business, knowing what your cash flow is likely to be. So 
if, for example, you know that 20% of your customers come back and purchase within six months, actually, for every £10 of revenue you take, you know that's actually going to be £12 of revenue, providing that the second purchase is of a similar value. And that means that you can spend a little more to get your customers. It means that you can compete a bit more against your competitors to get those customers through the door the first time. And then it really does allow you to actually say, okay, if I'm looking for my business investment, let's say in six or 12 months time, I can actually show potential investors what our forecast is based on what we did last year, because I know that 1,000 of our 10,000 new customers are going to buy again in the next six months. That gives me a certainty of revenue. So that's very much like a strong focus that I would want to have for any, certainly an e-commerce business, but ideally a service business as well. Um, Knowing your lifetime customer value, especially over six and 12 months, just because it gives you that cash flow forecast. And as I say, if you're looking at either scaling your business quickly or looking for investment, these are exactly the types of things that people like that want to see. And James, does, does this also then kind of prompt thinking around what other products and services you can put in place around your hero product or your primary product so that you can keep getting people to come back? Maybe they're not buying the same thing, but they might be buying other products and services from you. Yes. So actually, something that we've done um, with Kitbricks, which is a company that me and Lara both part own, is we were looking at what new product development that we do for the next year. And this was just before the pandemic, but as in we've since gone on and put that into action. But we invited effectively um, 50 of our top customers to a effectively like a meeting in London. And actually, we had about 25 in the end who were able to come. Um, but of those 25, we were actually able to have a really good conversation with our best customers about what they wanted next. And so with that, that's really helped our new product development down the line because we know what our best customers want to buy. And that's always a good place to start. So I'd certainly be using those customers to learn what we should next actually offer, whether that's a service or actually whether it's, say, as an e-commerce product-based business. So, yes, you're completely right. And, and actually, I'm, I'm going to put that in this slide if I ever do that uh, this presentation again so a really good point to uh, pick up on um finally so on the real strategies that we want to actually implement going forwards this is whereby i've split it down into the size of business that you are because it will be quite different um depending on effectively what cash flow you have and actually it's a case of if you're say a startup getting to the point that you have enough cash flow to actually do the more advanced things on the marketing side that you would want to do so If you are a startup on a smaller budget, the first thing I would say to you, once you've got your tracking in place, is to actually go on and do some real retargeting on Facebook. So if you're a startup, you've got some initial traffic, you've done some sales, but you say you're not quite getting the traction you need to say really build up your sales to that next level. The best place to start when you're wanting continuous return on investment is to target your very best customers which are the people who have nearly purchased. So, sorry, not your best customers because they purchased, but the people who nearly purchased and actually didn't end up purchasing in the end. And that's where on Facebook, you can directly go in, providing you've got that tracking set up and say, I want to only target people who have been to the add to cart page on my website, but did not check out. And so with that, you can effectively have target your lowest hanging fruit and you can be potentially even cheeky with how you use your ads so for example might be like caught you looking here's 10% off to get them over the line or something like that Um, but very much targeting people who have nearly got to purchase and they just need something else to push them over the line it might not have to be an offer it might be actually just seeing your brand again you know oh they're like oh I've forgotten actually about that yesterday because I got distracted yes I'll go and buy that now so if you're a small business and a startup start with targeting the people who have added to your cart followed by the people who have looked at specific products or specific services on your website the reason being again is because there's that additional level of interest as opposed to them just visiting your home page so for example um, let's say we're the women's chapter and we've got all of our company's products on our website um, using lara's if somebody's looked at a centered product 
I would be wanting to serve them an ad which featured the scented product, even though it's actually for the women's chapter, because I know that they're most likely to go through, look at the product they've already taken interest in and actually then go and make the purchase. So again, that's my second best chance of getting a strong ROI. And that effectively means that if we can build up enough in this area for people who have previously visited the website and shown interest, that should give us the budget to actually start ranging and broadening what we're doing which would go directly um, based on our experience directly into Google ads. So we build up first on Facebook. We start getting an ROI by targeting people who have visited us on the website. And then we move that cash that we've actually managed to build from the return there into Google ads and start bidding on some very specific things. So specific intent would be, as an example, um, in Centered's case, which is an aromatherapy balm, it would be buy aromatherapy balm. And then effectively that's, we are competing for somebody who's not typing in our brand name. And then therefore we might well get that purchase. And if we want something, Google ads is perfect because unlike Facebook, we're not interrupting them on Google ads. People are actually searching for the product or solution that we offer. So actually it's a really nice way to start off your, what I would call new customer marketing because they've never potentially heard of us if they typed in buy aromatherapy balm. But actually if we are there, that's going to be our best chance of getting those initial sales. So again, it's starting where the ROI is going to be the highest early on. And then we branch out more and more as we see that ROI come in. Once we're sort of a little larger, i.e. small to medium, you might find that there's people searching for your brand just on Google anyway. And it's a real catch 22 because I hate brand term bidding. So as an example, if somebody typed in James Oakley Media, because you're almost cannibalizing your own organic traffic, but if, say, you're an e-commerce business and actually you sell, let's say, on Planet Organic or something like that, or on Amazon, Amazon will 100% have its ad up when somebody types in your brand name if you sell on Amazon. So in that sense, you might find that given Amazon's margins and the commission that they take, it's actually cheaper for you to bid on your own brand name and take away Amazon's clicks and sell direct to consumer. Two reasons. Number one, you don't have the Amazon commission. Number two, you get all of your customer data as opposed to Amazon where you simply don't. Um, and the final part, once you've got those two working is actually based on solutions. So I've just used this as an example here. Um, we work with a company, really great company called the Fine Bedding Company, also women owned by the way. Um, Claire Watkin owns it. She's a, I say, lovely, really great. We've grown with them. Um, and as an example, this is very much based on somebody's problem that you can fix. So we've actually stopped bidding on this ad term now. And the reason is, is because we're number one for it on an organic term. But SEO and building your organic listings does take time, whereas Google Ads, you can go straight to the top. So this would be my next stage of branching out your early Google Ads. And it would be based on offering a direct solution for somebody. So if you sell a product that helps people to sleep better, actually bidding on something like, let's say, can't sleep after exercise, if that's what your product does, helps people sleep and be calm and have a restorative night's sleep, you want to be bidding on something like that because it's very likely that I'm going to be wanting to buy a product which helps me sleep after exercise. So if we've got something along those lines, that will be really, really useful going forwards. And again, like I've got on every one of these sample slides, split test your ad creative, split test your copy and your landing pages as much as you possibly can. At the start, you'll probably only be able to do two landing pages, two sets of ad copy because of budget. But actually, let's say three months down the line, once you have this working really well, you might have, say, four different landing pages, five different sets of ad copy and three creative. So you will grow, but always make sure you are split testing because I promise you, you will significantly bring down your costs. Um, and I will show you some examples of, of actually doing that as well. So once you've got that hopefully in hand and actually you've grown a little bit more, I'll just get that middle slide for a moment, is actually moving on to when you sort of become that more consistent sales, let's say, again, looking at that sort of 250 sales or more a month, actually you want to begin branching out what you're doing on Facebook and what you're doing on Google. And again, from an ROI perspective, this is where it becomes harder, especially since the iOS update, which Facebook implemented back in May. So if you're looking to achieve a direct ROI and you're doing this now, again, feel free to, to message me after. I'd be very happy to have a look at any campaigns, give any advice if, if there's something I can add value to. But used to be six months ago, simply the tab on the left, best purchase of lookalike targeting. 
and you could literally look at any customer who's purchased from you, let's say as an example, a minimum of two or three times, and providing you have at least a hundred, um, sorry, at least 500 of those customers, you can put that data into Facebook and Facebook will go and find a lookalike audience who's just like your best purchases. And that used to be ideal and we could run a lot of ads, which would be really profitable simply by targeting lookalikes. With the iOS update, that has changed. So it's still relevant and I would still be doing it and I'd still start there. And I would still start on best customers as opposed to all customers. But again, if you're not quite up to where you have, say, 500 people who have purchased more than once from you, start with your customers because that's still better than anywhere else and build those lookalike audiences. But additionally, what we found has worked really well is specific interest part targeting. So this is whereby with Facebook, you might have done this before on the ad screen and you can go to detailed interests and you can add things as an example is interested in aromatherapy, is interested in entrepreneurship, is interested in um, you know, whole foods, as an example. So with that, it's taking that to the next level, which Facebook doesn't directly offer you. So if I typed in, if I have a golf product and we work with um, a golf brand doing this actively um, in the US at the moment, and I actually type in, as an example, onto Facebook's interest golf, I will get tens of millions of people who are interested in golf. Whereas actually, if I want to reach people who are going to buy a golf product, I probably need to target people who actually play golf and at least follow it very closely who might well buy my um, apparel, basically, apparel. Um, so with that, what I would be doing is targeting, and what we do is target very specific players um, who actually therefore would only be followed by somebody who has a real interest in golf or plays golf. So for example, it wouldn't be um, in the UK's case, Lee Westwood, who's sort of you know one of our top golfers, he's got millions of fans in the UK. It would be somebody who had maybe a couple of hundred thousand fans worldwide because it's smaller and much more niche. And only people who play golf regularly or follow golf really closely would actually um, know who he or her is. And taking your interest targeting down really helps because that way you're not just targeting everybody who's interested, you're targeting people who are, have a very specific interest in your effectively product area. So that is another thing which you should definitely be testing once you've looked at your lookalike targeting, or even if you found that you were doing lookalike targeting and it was working great, but actually your purchase cost, as an example, may well have doubled or tripled in the last six months. And that's not unusual, by the way, that really has happened. Um, hence, we've needed to find the workarounds around it. The final stage, once you've um, gone through those stages, is funnels um, and driving people based on really engaging ads. And in the last um, class that we did, I went over a couple of examples with Kit Bricks whereby we targeted people who were interested in outdoor swimming with an ad around the most dangerous outdoor swims to do in the world, things like that, whereby you get a lot of very cheap traffic to your website. And the key is combining the first two tabs on this graph which is your best patch to lookalikes and specific interest targeting with something which is really engaging for that group and actually getting ideally thousands of people on your website for around 15 to 20 P per click. And that can still happen because then that means that not only will they potentially buy from your website, but you also build up a whole new group of people to go and retarget based on where they go on your website. And that is massively useful because it allows you to have something which isn't as high potentially on the ROI side initially to go straight through and retarget them, which will be the highest part of ROI of any marketing that you're doing digitally. So if you're targeting new customers, your ROI will always be higher when you're retargeting. So it effectively gives you another way to build up that retargeting list really quickly and actually suddenly put in a whole new funnel of sales into your business that you didn't have before. And the key is knowing your business really well and what somebody's going to relate to. So you've really got to bring that out and then use that as best possible. And again, as always, combine that with ad copy and landing page testing, as well as the creatives that you use. Um, just a little crunch on time. I want to make sure we've got enough time for questions at the end. So I'll run through the next slide on Google Ads rather briefly, but again, feel free to come back to me at any point, is actually once you've gone through to that stage within your company, getting onto Google Ads, again, you can also target people who are similar to your customers with Google Ads, and you can also target people who have been on your website. So I'd certainly be doing that. 
Um, but additionally, in the same way as the funnel driving engaging ads on this slide, if you can target people who are doing research and comparison based searches on Google, for example, best aromatherapy balm, or why should I use an aromatherapy balm in Centred's case, we can actually go and then add them almost to our retargeting list to then target with product based ads. So it's another way of adding really engaged people to your retargeting list, which you can then effectively use to target and obtain that higher ROI. And the last thing just on this slide is competitor bidding, which it may be a good thing or may not. Normally, competitors will simply come back and also bid on your name. That's sort of the typical tit for tat, and you've got to work out if that's worthwhile. But there are some very cool things, I think, that we've done recently, which have allowed us to do this, but in very much a comparative way. And um, a, a really good example, and where we actually got the initial idea from, is if you type in Trust Spot, um, sorry, Trust Pilot. Um, you will see ads from companies like TrustSpot and other competitors who have a direct comparison-based Google ad where it will be compare the features and the pricing of TrustPilot to TrustSpot, for example. And they're actually getting some really good click-through rates for us. Normally, you get a very low level of engagement because the people are interested in your competitor. But if you can show that you have a distinct point of difference, it might be that you're actually able to pick up a really large competitor who gets 25 times the searches that your brand does and actually get people interested in your brand. Because if you're selling the same solution or a very similar product, then those people are your customers. So you want to be able to be seen by them. So I would say that is worth considering, even if it's a larger competitor, providing that you have a distinct point of difference or a very specific benefit that you can show versus your competitor. Right, on to some direct examples, which I will run through. And I used one of these last time, but I've just implemented a new one um, onto the examples list here. And I can zoom in um, in a moment as well if we need to. But a real life example of Google Ads whereby we've effectively tested and seen direct results is the middle image here. Where Can everybody see, or Michelle, can you see where it says device, computers and mobile phones? Is that clear to you? Yes, but I think we probably would benefit from having a zoom in. Um, I'll just zoom out and then I will zoom in or well, I'll try to in a moment apologies yeah and, um, just because um from what I can see on zoom it doesn't share like the screen completely no problem I'll, I'll make it let's see if I can zoom in on here um but oh, there we go yeah I'll specifically zoom in on that in, in a moment, um, just so that we can okay. all view it. Um, but the base premise is that actually we were running um, a really large campaign in terms of this is, by the way, you can see here that's been spent three and a half thousand pounds within this campaign. And what you'll also see is that it's split between people on desktop computers and people on mobile phones. Mm -hmm. When you look at the bid adjustment, which is the fourth column along, you'll see that the mobile phones, they have a bid adjustment of minus 65%. And that was because this particular company, we were really struggling. We needed to get conversions basically for under 70 pounds. That was sort of our target. Um, and with that, they were really struggling to do that on mobile. And so what we did is we effectively then therefore adjusted the mobile bidding so that we would bid 65% less for a, if somebody was on a mobile making the same search than we would to somebody who was making a tablet-based search. And we did the same with computers, but 25% only. And what you should be able to see, Michelle, let me know if there's any problems, is the cost per conversion, which is the second to last column on the right, goes from 65 pounds on a computer all the way down to 11 pounds on a mobile. Can you see that on the right-hand side? Yes, I can. Great. So effectively that we are running at this point almost exactly the same ads. We've got a very slight copy difference on the mobile based ad, but effectively it's the same search terms and our cost per conversion is one fifth of what it is on a desktop on a mobile. And nearly every other search um, campaigns you'd see, if you looked at something standard, you would be paying more for a mobile purchase than you would for a desktop. Um, but what we've done is effectively adjusted the amount that we're willing to bid. And that therefore has brought down the number of clicks on the website. So you'll see here there's, only 600 clicks from mobile versus 2000 from desktop. But actually from that, we've had therefore 
half of the purchases, but from one quarter of the clicks. Therefore, we've managed to save a lot of money. And the cost per click is effectively significantly reduced by the fact that we say we are not willing to bid anything more than X, which means that we've paid 45 pence per click as opposed to £1.50 on a desktop. And actually, this is sort of, we're now running these campaigns across a number of clients, but this we only found this around three or four months ago, whereby if you reduce that bidding, what we do is we almost begin to start getting those sales towards the end of the day when all of our competitors' uh, budgets have run out. So we almost let them take all of the expensive clicks, all of the top positions, and actually we come in underneath because we don't have as big a budget as, um, as an example, a competitor um, to this company is John Lewis, who have millions and millions of pounds. Um, so because we say, well, we're not willing to bid near those, we effectively start coming out during when we're clicked on and we're in third place because John Lewis and somebody else are above us. And mm-hmm. actually later in the day when John Lewis and somebody's budget has finally turned off and we find that's when we get those purchases. So by looking at the stats and the data, we're actually able to say, well, okay, where we are now, that is growth enough for us at the moment over the course of this couple of weeks. And therefore, we can actually afford to do that. What we actually previously had prior to this screenshot is a bid adjustment of minus 80%, but it didn't quite bring us in enough traffic. So we had to bring bidding up slightly. But again, it allows you to scale your revenue within your company, knowing that you're going to get a positive ROI at all times. So the next stage for this campaign, as an example, will be to actually go and have a bid adjustment of minus 50% instead of 65%. And we want to see if that ups our traffic enough, but still keeps that cost per conversion significantly lower than 65 pounds, which is sort of the baseline for where we're at at the moment. And if we do that, that means actually that we can go on to creating around 100 extra purchases a month that wouldn't have previously been made. And to that company, if the purchases are, let's say even at 20 pounds, that is actually a 5,000 pounds profit in terms of directly from ads before costs every month and therefore £60,000 a year. And that's where we can really look at, okay, this is our true ROI. How much do we now want to spend? How much are we willing to pay for a new customer to very quickly scale the stage of our business? Then the last, uh, sorry, the second to last um, example on Google ads is something I've used before, which is just showing back in 2018, the difference between having mobile friendly in your ad copy and not. So again, still you want to be addressing people who are on a mobile so that they know you'd write scroll, for example, um, or swipe instead of um, just scroll on a computer. Um, And also the top example, which is on Kitbricks, which I will make bigger later and send around in the slides because I feel that might be slightly small, but very simply the call to action there is get offer as opposed to shop now. And you'll see a significant reduction in cost when you're saying somebody get this offer as opposed to shop now, even if the offer was the same for the exact product. So it's no different. And then is is that an example of split testing there where you've done the shop now and, and get offer? The shop now and get offer is split testing and also the mobile friendly on the events calendar is also direct split testing. So both of those were served to exactly the same searches or people depending on the platform and the only difference effectively was the copy. So they went to the same landing page, they saw the same image on Facebook, all the copy was the same on Google Ads with the exception of having mobile friendly and we've just seen as I say like majorly different results based off that. Now I'm showing you like significant changes here, like say 30, 40%, but normally that's actually not unusual. So often you might find that, for example, if if an agency was pitching you, they'd probably show something like, here's an example of when we got a hundred percent reduction in cost for our customer, but actually 30 to 40% is still massive for most businesses. And if you're doing split testing like this, I promise you, you will make incremental gains of 10 to 15%. And once you do that a couple of times, that will make a difference of 30 to 40% in your business and your cost per acquisition for new customers over time. So it really is a case of constantly split testing, like Michelle mentioned, and also having that focus on your best channels, because none of us here probably, let's say, have that budget of John Lewis or Amazon. And so with that in mind, we will always run out of budget at the end of the day. So there's no reason for us to bid as much as John Lewis or Amazon because we should simply be taking the very best traffic that's likely to convert, not simply going off, you know, getting our brand name out to to everybody. Mm. 
And just as a matter of interest, the, the, the middle block here where you've got computers versus mobile phones, yeah. I mean, what was the product, what was the, the, the product cost there, the unit cost? Yeah, in terms of what actually did the product cost to, to buy? Yeah, so. just because I'm looking at kind of the, 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 um, the conversions, the, obviously the cost per acquisition, you know, those, the, is that a higher cost item? Yeah, uh, so the average transaction value for, for this particular company, they sell a range of products, is £130. Okay. Uh, but as I say, they have solid margins and, and effectively our, our brief is you must get sales for under £70, 70 pounds a sale. That's like the, where they, again, can know that they break even and go on and customers repurchase. So in that sense, that's the minimum we need to meet. But as you can see on mobile, it's significantly below that. Hence, the next stage is to move that bid adjustment up. But prior to this, mobile phones was off the scale in terms of how expensive. And it's because so many more people search on a mobile than a desktop these days mm. that, again, you have to realize, OK, we've got X amount of budget. We can't spend that much for each conversion. So therefore, we need to be really clever. We say, OK, we're actually not going to appear for 80 percent of the search results. But the 20 percent we do, we're going to get 80 percent of the results. And that's very much like that 80 20 principle mm. of making sure we focus on our very best ROI areas as opposed to sort of being sort of more freewheeling about it and sort of think, okay, we'll find it. Actually, we cut out mobile spend and we bring it up as we can bring it up still under that conversion rate. So that's, as I say, been something which has consistently now worked for a number of months and it has become really useful in every campaign that we run. We would always look at, okay, what's the mobile computer difference? Nearly every time mobiles are more expensive to convert on, and the first thing we do is, okay, we'll take mobiles down by X percentage, depending on how much more expensive it is. And it constantly works. And again, anybody who's doing Google Ads, check exactly the same on yours. You will be able to see it in Google Ads and make that adjustment. Your budget will serve you a lot better. Your ROI will be higher. Great, thank you. No worries. And then I just wanted to give a couple more examples. Um, some companies we work with, some we don't. Um, mm. Just on actual ads, which people have been doing, because obviously I've spoken a lot about the types of ads that you should be running in terms of from a retargeting perspective, from people who have added to cart, and then obviously on that larger scale from getting people interested into what you're doing. And I've just picked out, I'd say, a couple of companies. Um, there's actually three companies here two we don't work with, one we do, but who are doing things really, really well. Um, and one is Warpaint for Men, really interesting company, um, by the way, it's effectively makeup for men. They use a lot of video in what they do. And effectively, the two ads, um, which I've picked out as the samples here, they are actively running like right now. And there's two different things. One is effectively building on the, the, uh, the image with the razor is looking to build their email database list. And this is because they know that email is their most um, productive from an ROI perspective um, channel and also their most profitable channel overall. So they're looking at effectively building that email list as much as they physically can. And with that, the reason I mentioned around email is because for them and us to write one email to 2,000 people is the same amount of effort as it is to write an email to 25,000 people or 100,000 people. So the more people we add to our email database, if we know that 5% of our email database converts, if we can add another 20,000 people, providing they're similar to our existing customers and a good type of person to add, we can then again look at actually scaling our business via email as another channel alongside Facebook and Google Ads. And the ad on the left is effectively an ad which is run um, only to people who have effectively added to the cart, but actually not purchased. And there's actually effectively an, an offer on, therefore, and they must have added to the cart at least three days ago in this case. And that means that effectively they haven't come back and bought the next day. There's a good chance they've forgotten effectively. And then therefore, actually, we want to pick those people up by giving them something which is actually a pretty good offer to get them over the line. Because often you'll find people come back within one day and purchase. But actually, if they haven't come back within that first day, they're unlikely to purchase in the future. So this is a really good way to retarget people who have nearly purchased before, but actually it's been a couple of days and we don't want them to forget about us as a brand. So straight away there, it's an offer in, we get that customer in. And because this is a replenishable product, obviously providing they buy again, then obviously that's going to be very worthwhile for us to give that discount on that first sale. And then... James, I just want to comment on the um, the first one that you mentioned with the razor, and I um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems like a really good 
uh, way to qualify your audience because they'd be signing up because they want your product. Um, I mean, I suppose ultimately whether or not they were prepared to pay for it is a, is a different story, but yeah. to build a database, because I think that's also a challenge that a lot of startup brands face, yeah. is really getting the volume and the people signed up to their communication so that they can start to convert them, which ultimately is much cheaper than having to advertise to those people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, that seems like a really good way to get people signed up where they're qualified in terms of their interest and their, their desire for your product. Yeah, and you're, you're completely right. So when, when we run anything which is based on competition, because I, the worst thing you could do is say, combine with another brand and say, like and follow us on Instagram um, for it to be in with a chance of winning something, because that way you only have people who like and follow you who wanted the competition. However, if when you're actually running an ad, which is targeted to people similar to your current customers, whereby that the actual razor itself is qualifying, like you say, because they have to want to use that product to make it worthwhile for them bothering to enter. It's not like a monetary value. Mm -hmm. And also, as I say, from the stats, we know, um, not just with this company, by the way, but with nearly every company that actually email is that most profitable source of uh, per user. So for every email user who goes to your website versus every user from all other channels, the email users will almost definitely be more likely to buy. And obviously you, that, for that reason, providing you build up a proper email database, which is similar to your existing customers, that can mean that, again, like you say, it builds up a number of future customers who might convert in a week, might be a month, or it might only be on Black Friday for the first time in, three, in two months' time. But actually, that's really good because then they buy from you four more times over the course of the year. So yes, absolutely. And especially in the run-up to quarter four, building that email list in October is going to be massive because people are going to be in a buying mood from the 1st of November because people are going to go earlier this year. I warn you all of that now. So if you have stock, you will be um, pleased because November will be a full buying month and people will go from the 1st, not the 21st. Um, on the interest of time, there's just something else I really want to show you all. But Shampoo is a company we don't work with, but they run lovely ads. And you can see here that they've used testimonials in their ad. Testimonials, by the way, if somebody's been on your website and also if somebody hasn't, they're one of the best ways to get people engaged and wanting your product. I'd highly recommend that. And then also, just showing you here, the last slide is on examples whereby actually people have directly addressed in their advertising the fact that you've added to the cart and not purchased yet. So the, the sample I showed you previously with war paint, actually it wasn't directly addressing. It was making you feel like you've got an offer to take up. Nasty girl here in pose, you can just see here, they've actually actively addressed that you've added to cart. So your cart is wondering where you went. And remember these buttes for Sonos speakers. So in that sense, they're actively saying like, we know, you know you're interested as such. And then obviously having something else underneath. What you could also add is something along the lines of your car is wondering where you went. Here's 10% off, you know, and with something like an incentive if you really want to push them over the line. But we've done some testing of this, especially in recent months, and it's worked quite well. As I say, we're testing more of it. So probably by next month, I'd be able to say to you, yes, definitely do this. But we are seeing more companies do this and we are beginning to do this ourselves. So this is definitely something which I would say go and test again, like everything else, and see if actually bringing up the fact that somebody's been on your website um, is actually something which you want to do. Especially if you're a playful brand, you can have some real fun with that um, because you can actually, again, it could be like caught you looking. That's something that we've used really well. Um, there's a company called Desmond and Dempsey who also run ads like these. They do really nice worded um, add, to cart email, uh, add to cart ads as well. Um, but I'd definitely say to go and test that um, too. So again, right back to the first slide, and I, I am now done, so any questions, please um, do yeah. let me know. But just constantly, as I say, the major thing is track and set up your monitoring, test continuously, and make your decisions based off the results of testing. That's like, it's very simple, but that is how you get an ROI-focused digital campaign. And also understanding your customer base. You're, you're you know, building those avatars and understanding who is actually buying from you. Completely. And as I say, you can do that at all levels, however small you are. It's just you have to get more personal at that smaller stage. Thank you, James. That's amazing. Um, everyone, please, if you've got questions, either pop them in the chat or if you would like to ask a question, um, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Hi, James. 
don't know if you can see me or not. No, I, don't know. I, just, I, I can. You can? Okay. I can't, I can't see myself, but I just want to say hi because we spoke a few times in the... We, we spoke in August and then September and I just... Um, I, have you had a chance to, to look at the website or have initial thoughts or...? Yes, yeah, so I sent you through initial thoughts. Um, I'll resend is in just just after this and to, to run through it, and then if yeah. any questions based off that, feel free to uh, send it through, or I'll give you a, a call time and we'll speak um, this Friday. Yeah, like yeah just uh, just an email is good for. Um, I guess uh, the the question for me is obviously I I you know the the mar- the market I'm working in is very focused yeah. on luxury. Um, and so I'm just wondering whether on everything that you've spoken about so far in the two session, you, you feel that it can be applied to any, any product or is there sort of slightly different strategy for different markets? Yeah. Um, so in terms of as a general rule, yes, it absolutely can. I, I actually, because I know your business more personally, um, obviously because you have that high price point at the start and premium product, um, obviously to get, say, those first, let's say, 10 buyers to actually then go and do that research with might take slightly longer or you might need to go a different way in terms of doing that. But once you actually have them, yes, absolutely. So it's just a case of actually getting them in the first place, but providing you have those initial buyers, exactly the same. And, and actually with that premium price product, going more personal actually is something you can do on a permanent basis. And that's obviously really good from an aspect of, customer service getting people to rebuy and also recommending you to their friends and that's again something which will be i imagine like a very important part of your business because yeah. the people's friends are more likely to buy because they'll be similar to them yeah yeah absolutely okay great thanks um i think nikki's raised a hand Do you want to ask a question nikki hi james um hi my, hi, hi hi um so our business is going through a really exciting change right now. And um, obviously we're in the sort of beauty space at the moment. Um, and I definitely will get in touch with you, um, uh, you know, um, separately. Um, I suppose I also had a question about, um, you know, organic SEO, which, as you said, t- takes longer. It's a longer haul. It's a longer game. Um, is it worth investing in that alongside the paid um, paid digital marketing um and also do you help with um building um email lists and what's the best way of because we've just moved to clavio which has been fantastic right um, and we are in cre- you know focused on, on on growing our email list but i had those two questions really um and video content does that improve um the kind of reach and engagement um and is it worth investing in video content and video advertising and um, firstly just on the middle question Clav- Clavio is great I would highly recommend it I think you've probably made a great decision did you swap from Mailchimp well, yeah we swapped from Mailchimp and that was just so clunky and in- unintuitive <laughs> yeah that's completely and if I was doing like the same slides on scaling your business it'd be Mailchimp at the start and once you are at that sort of more fast growth pace swapping to, to Clavio is going to be or, or something like Clavio, really, really good. Um, and that will serve you well. So yes, in terms of on that, firstly, like actually funny, funny you mentioned the beauty space because we work a lot within that as well. Um, but yes, so growing emails there. And the good thing about Clavio is it will give you a whole load of automations based off what people have done that you can send. So like what I mentioned around the add to cards, you would also be able to send emails based on, for example, the value of somebody's cart and things like that. So you could send different emails if they have a higher cart value to what you'd send somebody who say is spending under 50 pounds. So you'll, you'll get loads more flexibility there. Definitely. Um, on the video point, yes, providing it is a good video. And by that, what I mean is obviously that's different for everybody, but it needs to be engaging. And effectively it needs to ideally be either very benefit focused or actually testimonial focused. So the war paint ads, nearly all ads that we run with them um, are actually based on real people. Um, in that sense, who have actually used the product or actually influencers who have used the product. And they, because they do great video content, it works really well. Um, a number of companies we work with, we actually, it might not always be, firstly, the, the best thing from a financial perspective, but also from an RRI perspective, it might not be the best thing to hire a video, uh, a videographer. 
actually it might be better to pay an influencer that equivalent who you know is going to do you an amazing video providing again that their followers are your types of customers and actually yeah. have something that you know is going to be tailored to the exact type of people you want to reach so i'd highly recommend potentially doing that which might actually save you some money also and give you potentially coverage on an influencer channel or, or something like that um finally on the seo um and i I could talk about SEO, honestly, for, and we will probably for a whole different session because it is so important. Um, the reason I haven't addressed it in this, these slides specifically is because from an ROI perspective, it's harder to put on a direct value because you would either put in your time or let's say pay a company to, to do this and they would normally report back, yes, rankings results, but also, for example, content, backlinks, achieve partnerships with like-minded companies, things like that. Um, but it's absolutely important. If you're looking, say, from a longer perspective, SEO is like building your house and then therefore you own that space once you're, say, number one, two or three on Google. And PPC, Facebook ads, is very much like renting that house at the top of the... And once you stop paying, you obviously you lose that. So SEO is absolutely important. And uh, at some point, actually, I will have to do something specifically on that because long-term growth of your business that's got to be one of your four main channels um, alongside your paid ads so yes and uh, congrats on moving to Clavio again you'll have a much nicer email life and more ROI thanks very much and I'll get in touch via email shall I later or um, yeah, yeah. yeah I'll do a follow-up where I'll introduce James to everyone and I'll share the slides um, so you can you can send him questions um, from there great thank you <laughs> thanks very much for the talk you're welcome thanks does anyone i think we've got time for one last question before we have to finish off if anyone has one james i have a question and i don't know how long the answer to this would be but um i'm conscious that today we've spoken a lot about uk exposure and and return on investment in the uk and i know for product-based businesses with brexit and everything's going on it's very challenging to be trying to break into new markets right now but possibly for those who have service-based businesses, are there any markets that you've identified that are quite interesting to break into from a brand awareness perspective if you have a product? So it's sort of kind of a market you might be lining up to sell into or yeah. for services, um, you know, possibly those that have online training or anything like that where they could be getting good conversions that might cost less than what it costs to advertise here. Yeah. Um, so fu funny you say that only because actually for, for us as a business, um, around 30% of our client base is actually we're actively doing things overseas. So it might not be that they're based there, but they're either actually actively trading in other countries or actually, as an example, with Drew Golf Boats, who I mentioned earlier, they are based in the US. They are only US that we work with them on. Um, so definitely is that market like we're an example of say how a service based company can do that um, whether around say which areas you target very, very typically and this, this is a rule of thumb not exact if you look at as an example your eastern europe things like that you will be it will be much much less expensive um, far far less expensive than the uk and the nordic countries um, which are generally the most expensive then you have sort of your France, Italy, Germany, Spain, which I say in that middle. And I say the more east you go, effectively, the, the less expensive it gets. In the US, it will be more expensive, but people, as a general rule of thumb, spend more. And effectively, you may have different dollar pricing. So again, if you're looking at that international expansion, um, that's always a good way to, to look at it. And the key is going to be logistics, i.e. how you ship. So many of you might have had issues with shipping to the EU, for example, unless you're already based there. Um, whereas obviously with the US, it's always been the same kind of setup. So it's not the same level of transition. Um, what I would say is like, take it, it will be the individual circumstance of the business. But if you have something, as an example, um, we work with a couple of retreat based businesses, it's knowing which other companies, um, if, sorry, which other countries are most interested in that since are most likely to book. So as an example, um, actually taking into account a beauty brand we work with, we know that actually Germany is like the second biggest market in Europe, including the UK for that. And therefore like that was the first country actually that we've gone into. And we've now gone into seven with this particular company I'm referring to, but Germany was like the number one base. So knowing your data and then effectively using that to work out logistically, can you fulfill? Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. That was really insightful. And I hope that everyone that joined us today um, got
got a, a good amount of benefit from that. I feel like I've, I've got a whole long list of things that I have to do here <laughs> on the back of that. Um, but it's, it's amazing food for thought. And I think to give us all the impetus to go out there and start making sure that just as a foundation, we've got our tracking in place because you cannot spend money based on what you don't know. Um, so I think that's, that's really useful. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, everyone. I will follow up with an email, as I said, um, the recording as well as the slides. James, again, thank you so much for your time this morning. Invaluable. Pleasure. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, yeah, any questions that you think of after, feel free to send them to Michelle and I'll, I'll take them and contact you um, directly as well. Amazing. Thank you very much. Cheers, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye. Bye.